I want to invite our next uh, speakers up um, for the uh, housing and health care panel. Um, Are you healthy? The intersection of housing and health. Um, if you could all three come up and sit at the podium, or at the uh, panel over there, and then you could take turns coming here um, when it's time for you to speak, that would be great. Um, thank you, hi, and others, oh, Dr. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I actually, here's a, um, if you, you want to stand at the podium, you can be here. Otherwise, there's a hand mic here. And the there. So um, the intersection of housing and health could be a, the subject of a week-long conference. Um, but it's a new subject for most of us. Um, we've talked a lot about wanting to do something about housing and health, and, and again, thank you to Public Health for inspiring this conversation with us. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, we have heard, I think probably over the years, this idea of that housing is a social determinant of health, um, but we actually know very little about it, other than the public health folks who are here, which is only a handful. So we are very excited to have you all three here today. Um, your first speak, the first speaker up um, will be um, Depesh Navsaria. Um, he's a pediatrician working in the public interest. He blends the roles of physician, occasional children's librarian, educator, public health professional, and child health advocate. With graduate degrees in public health, children's librarianship, and assistant, uh, and Physician's Assistant Studies in Medicine, he brings a unique combination of interest and experience together. You'll also be hearing from Elizabeth or Liske, did I get that right? Liske. Um, Gies? Giese is the Health Officer Director of the Eau Claire County Health Department in Northwest Wisconsin. For more than 25 years, Liske is, has worked to improve public health through education, training, research, assessment, and service. She's worked on behalf of population health improvement in the private sector, local public health education, and state public health. For the past six years, she's been the local health department director in Eau Claire, where she's worked to build partnerships, leverage funding opportunities, and create more innovative and effective department. Dr. Swain is a board-certified family physician with extensive clinical teaching, um, uh, teaching health policy and public health leadership and practice experience, including as an academic medical faculty um, since 1990 and providing medical direction at the City of Milwaukee Health Department since 1993. His expertise in social and economic determinants of health and reducing health inequities through upstream population level policy and programmatic interventions. As a founding director of Wisconsin Health uh, Center for Health Equity, he has helped lead two focus areas of Wisconsin's 2020 state health plan, health disparities, and social and economic educational factors. Thank you all so much for being here today, and, um, and I know we are excited to learn about this very important intersection between housing, which all of us know so much, uh, you know, some of, some of us know a lot about, um, and, and health. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, okay, great. Um, hi, uh, Depeche Nufsari, a pediatrician, as you heard. I'm very excited to be here. Um, what I'm going to try to do here is pull together a lot of ideas about health, about the environment, and how they affect the body, how they affect long-term outcomes as kind of a framework to think about really not just housing, but all sorts of things that affect human beings and uh, really their life course in a, in a number of ways. Um, there's a lot of details I'll be leaving out because of the short amount of time that we have because there's so much to hear today. So if you have more questions, feel free to ask during the Q&A or come up during the break immediately afterwards. I'll be happy to talk to anyone in, in far more detail. Uh, and before anyone, uh, I'll answer the question uh, that everyone has when they see all the letters after my name and hear all the stuff that I do. Yes, I have a lot of student loan debt. So let's <laughs> get that out of the way. So there's a few broad principles that I think I'd like to share here that, that I think are probably obvious to most, but don't it's, it's worth repeating to kind of put this front and center in our minds. Brain architecture and abilities, we start with basic skills and we need to move up to more complicated skills over time. And that matters and makes a key difference in a number of ways. So you need to do early scaffolding in order to have more complex skills. So when people say things like, 
why do kids need X, Y, and Z? Um, why do they need to be in early childhood centers and ju they're just playing, right? That what happens early on doesn't matter. Well, the fact is that play is the work of infancy, okay? So if you think about it, right, if children have a rough start, right, if they are not in stable and secure housing, um, if their families are worried about where they will live the next day, the next week, the next month, et cetera, that has an effect on children from a young age. Because we know the human brain has a, a profoundly sensitive period early on. That if you look at this, um, this is not a linear graph here, right? That what we're seeing here is that this is the whole first year of life in this circle here. And then this is all the way from one to age 20. And you can see how much develops early on. Sensory pathways, language a little bit later, and higher cognitive function. Already by age one, right, the, the, the synapse formation has already kind of started to drop off, that so much is happening early on. So we need to recognize that when families are facing challenges, um, when family shelters are being cut, um, when we make it more difficult for families to be able to be in secure housing, that it has an effect on children in this young, early critical period. This is not to argue that we should just say, oh, this family has kids that are older than five. It's fine if we don't give them help. Far from it, of course, right? That would be, that would be ludicrous. But that early on makes a key difference and uh, will affect their entire lives. We know that kids over time, if you look at their development and health, which has a direct effect, of course, on their long-term outcomes, there's, a, there's sort of a three-legged stool about thinking about this. One is the biological factors that we look at all the time in healthcare. And these things matter, okay? That's, that's why we look at them. But then we recognized quite a few years ago that it wasn't just those factors, that the socioeconomic environment children are live in, and that sadly, a child's zip code matters more than their genetic code when it comes to thinking about their long-term outcomes. So place matters, surroundings matter, but it's not just the broader surroundings, it's also, quite frankly, the microenvironment around children. Who's in their home? Who's in their neighborhood? Who's in their early childhood center? Any of those sorts of places. And those micro um, microenvironments, those interactions that children have with people around them, those relationships matter intensely and deeply. And that brings me to the third point, that if you said, what is it that actually affects how the brain wires? It's two things. It's your genes, you need that to set the blueprint in place, and you need experiences. And, if, and it's not like, you can't have one without the other, right? It's like a campfire. You need wood and you need a spark in order to get that campfire going. Now, you can't modify genes so much, I have no time to talk about that today, but we can modify experiences. And how do we do that? We do it through advice we give, we do it through programs we set up, and we do it through policies that we enact. And then if you said, okay, what's the lever, the biggest lever we should be thinking about pulling? Well, it's about relationships that children are in. Do children have warm, secure, nurturing, loving relationships? And do they have adults that are capable of showing that love and, and nurturing that they want to for their kids? If they're constantly bombarded by the stress of meeting other basic needs, well, that makes it more difficult. This is the number one thing that affects the long-term outcomes of children, affects their ability to do well in education, and ultimately affects their, uh, their outcomes across the life course. Because we have this idea of toxic stress, and I'll define that a little more carefully in a moment, but this affects lifelong learning. It even affects physical health. We have great data about looking at other elements of uh, uh, things like heart disease uh, later on in life that are affected by how much adversity children are exposed to. So in our society, we talk a lot about stress, and we, we think of stress as a bad thing often, and certainly too much stress is. Zero stress is also not a good thing because that's also how you, if you have a little bit of stress actually is how you adapt and learn new skills, um, deal with different changes in the environment and so on. So we have a built-in stress response that's great if you are walking in the woods and you encounter a bear, right? That built-in stress response is designed to help you fight, run, freeze, whatever you need to do to survive. It's great when you run into a bear. It's not so great if you're constantly using that stress response every single day because you're not sure where you're living that night. You're not sure about where you'll eat 
um, you're not sure if you'll witness or be the subject of violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can think about sort of three levels of stress response. There's good stress, right? Mild, small amounts of stress that push you to actually push the envelope. That's good, that's why we call it positive. There's tolerable stressors, okay? And these are stressors that are shorter term, not necessarily super short, but they're, 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 they, they are temporary, and they're buffered by those supportive relationships. And that happens, again, when there's greater stability around what the family is encountering. This is in contrast to toxic stress. Toxic stress is when you have the stress response systems activated for a longer period of time, and there's few or no supportive relationships. So it matters how you, not just where people are, but who they're with. Some great research looking at um, uh, children, uh, who, people who were children during Hurricane Katrina. They followed them out over a decade and found that the kids who had the best long-term outcomes, it had less to do with where they were and more to do with were they together with their family and their family was supportive of each other. Right? And again, that stability happens when we have policies in place that say, let's keep families together, let's try not to move them too often, let's try to release, re relieve some of these outward stressors that exist. So if you think about childhood stress, and when they're always hitting that red alert button that sets off that, that stress response, right, that, that bear response that I talked about, they pump out these stress hormones like cortisol and epinephrine. This ha causes some changes in the brain that we, we won't have a chance to talk about today. But what we see, we see it in healthcare, we see it in schools, we see it in social services, we see it in all sorts of places, is kids who have this hyper-responsive stress response. Right? And this creates issues because they have all these layers of issues on top of their ability to learn well and ability to do more. And then what happens is that feeds into more stress. So we need to figure out how to, one, understand this cycle, but then two, figure out how to break this cycle. And of course, ideally, stop the trauma from happening in the first place, right? We spend a lot of time thinking about, oh, how do we fix the effects of trauma? Yes, but we should also be thinking about prevention. Think about how can we actually stop the trauma in, in the first place? So I think there's a lot of elements in this that, 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 that play into how we, how we look at things overall. Um, at the Population Health, Health Institute at UW, um, we, uh, we joke that we're legally required to show this to the students about once a month. Um, so this shows us the uh, health factors that um, go into uh, various health outcomes. 30% comes from health behaviors of various sorts, 20% comes from clinical care, but 40% are social and economic factors, and then 10% from the physical environment. The point of this is to show how much of health is influenced not by hospitals, clinics, medicine, doctor's visits, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of it is about the world. It's about the population and so on. How many of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah, I figured a fair number here. And for those of you who may need a reminder or aren't sure, um, Abraham Maslow basically said, look, you need to start with the basics, right? You need to start with air, food, water, sex, sleep, home homeostasis, excretion, right? These basic things about physiology need to happen before you can move up to the next point about safety and then love and belonging, esteem, and then finally, you know, what's your, what's your place in this universe and your, 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 your long-term goals, et cetera. If you don't have the bottom levels, you can't really address the top levels well. Right, so sometimes it's a little odd when we talk to people about what are your long-term career aspirations and they're sitting there going, I don't even know if where I'm gonna get dinner tonight, right? I don't even know if I'm gonna survive for another year given the violence in my area, et cetera, et cetera. So these, out, these other elements need to be dealt with first in order for people to even have a chance of thinking about those next levels. So thinking about this as a, how do we address what's at the bottom and then moving up from there? Because the social determinants of health, as we, as we call them, um, although some have argued that we should call them social influences of health, because determinants make it sound like there's absolutely um, no, no choice or no, no agency on the part of the, the, the person or family we're talking about, and I, I think that's a valid argument. Um, there's all sorts of things, right? Education, economic stability, built environment, community context, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So the way I view this is you can think about this in a long chain of, of influences and things leading to one another. 
If our goal is to have productive, happy adults in our society, okay, we, 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 we hope that's, that's what we're, we're all aiming for here. Well, how are they going to get there? One of the largest uh, ways to, best ways to get there, of course, is for them to be successful in the education system that we have because that leads to uh, a fulfilling career, um, being paid reasonably well, and having access to all the resources that often leads to better uh, health and well-being overall. Okay. Well, how do we get there? Well, we need them to have brains that are primed for school success and being able to take advantage of what the school system has to offer and also the socio-emotional skills to do well in, in the society that we have. That happens based on early experiences that mold that brain for learning. That happens through these nurturing, responsive interactions that adults are having with children. That means adults need to know how to do that. It also means they need to have the capability and capacity to do those things, right? So I've run into many parents who say, yes, I would love to read to my child every night, but it's not feasible because I'm working two jobs, right? The lack of a living wage means people are having to work multiple jobs, and that directly influences their ability to do the job of good parenting that they want to do and know how to do, but are blocked from doing because of these other factors that are getting in the way, right? When I have been a volunteer at the student-run uh, free clinics, the medic clinics at UW um, at Salvation Army, right, seeing families trying their best to do the job of parenting in the midst of, you know, the, the, in, the instability that comes with just being in a shelter. Yes, they're in a shelter, that's great, but of course there's so many question marks about what's happening next. Uh, when I run into families, I had a family the, in, in, in a clinic that I was helping cover met them for the first time, and they, the child uh, who's about um, uh, six or seven years old, there was questions about his ability to pay attention, and he had been placed on, um, on, on uh, Adderall by uh, someone before me. And he, he had some positive effect, but you know, still not doing great, and this family came in and, and to, to kind of follow up on things, and I said, you know, how was he doing, you know, earlier, preschool, et cetera? Oh, well, he was, he was fine, et cetera. And um, really everything seemed to be an issue in the last couple of years. And I asked the question that apparently no one had asked them. Have there been any big changes or stressors in your family as of late? And it turned out that like, it was like a dam bursting. Mom looks at me and says, well, yes. Um, my mother died. We were living with her. And then we were living with my sister, but she couldn't keep us uh, any longer, so we've actually been in a shelter for the last um, several weeks. Um, my husband, well, there was domestic violence, so we've been fleeing that. Um, and by the way, oh yes, my mother died, and that's why we had to leave her, you know, her, her home, because she, she, she passed away. And there was all these stressors piling up. And is it any wonder that this child is unable to pay attention in school? I mean, duh, right? So, um, sure, maybe he needs Adderall. I, I wasn't actually super sure about that. But for crying out loud, this family needs referral to a whole bunch of different resources. And they had some of those in place, but not all of them. And they need, to, they need actually therapy. They've gone through so many losses and betrayals and, and, and stressors that this is not just ADHD, my goodness, this is a response and reaction to all these determinants around them. And the question hadn't been asked, right? The question hadn't been asked. And even though the older sister and the mother were not my patients that day, I was like, yeah, you, you all need to do this together. So adults need these capabilities and they need the stability in their environment to be able to, put the, to do this for children. And as a reminder, what do we do? It's through programs, policies, and advice, right, that ultimately are the levers we're pulling when we sit in rooms like this and say, okay, what can, what can we do um, to, make, to make a key and critical difference um, for children? So some, some closing thoughts before I turn this over to, to my colleagues. I like to think of what we do as a, as a community, as a society, as a series of nets, so to speak. Um, we know that the world means that some children and families are going to fall, okay? So we, we need a net to catch them and say, let's catch you, help you out here, and get you back to where you need to be um, so you can, you can thrive, right? So the first net, the big net, is a prevention net, 
Okay, it's a net that has big holes. I'm not pretending that we can prevent our way out of everything, but we need that, that net there. And that'll catch, hopefully, a fair number of the people before they fall further down um, and, and need more help. So the, what about the folks who fall through those, uh, the holes in that system? Okay, that's your screening, your more targeted interventions, right? More intensity, more help that we can do, et cetera, et cetera. Still some holes in that system, but it's smaller holes. So you're catching a whole lot of people. And then finally, you go down to the treatment net, okay? Um, however you, you define treatment, whatever you're looking at, right? That is a small net. If that net tries to catch everyone, they're gonna fall off the edge. And that's what happens far too often. All levels of this model are necessary. None on their own are sufficient, okay? So whatever you do, whatever place in the ecosystem that you, around housing and all that you uh, occupy, ask yourself, which of these levels am I directly involved with? You might be involved with all three. You might be involved with just one, and that's okay. But then ask yourself, and who are the people at the other levels, right? If you work on, on uh, preventing you know, eviction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay, who's in the net above you and below you? you know? um, if you're down at the treatment, we need to get people you know, what they need um, because they've already fallen so far. Okay, well, what's, who's in the nets above you? And how can you help bolster what they do so that you aren't getting as, as overwhelmed and so on? Because we also need to realize there's some really perverse incentives in how we do things. Um, this uh, shows an example of what happens about how we punish people for actually getting better jobs, okay? Um, on the um, vertical axis here, so this is your, on the horizontal axis here is um, hourly or annual wage, okay? So total kind of, you know, how much money you, you are bringing in your income. Um, on the vertical axis is what your actual monthly resources are. How much money do you actually have to run your household, et cetera? You can see at a very low wage, okay, you get um, some supports that help, you know, push that up above $500 there in, in this example. And then you can see there are these sudden little drops here and sometimes some rather precipitous drops. What's happening there? Once you get above a certain point, you lose eligibility for food stamps and WIC or child care copays go up. Um, you know, tax burdens, housing assistance, uh, child care assistance, right? It is actually, you're worse off when you take a better job in some situations because of how we've constructed these breakpoints. And many people who are, will look at this and say, hmm, I'm gonna turn down that pay raise or that promotion, even though it means more take home pay in a sense, I have less resources. That's ridiculous. Why are we putting people in a system of having to play this sort of game? So we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing when we set up our rules and guidelines and criteria? We're incentivizing people to do other sorts of things. I also like this slide here, um, talking about uh, different types of two-generation approaches. We need good programs, policies. We need to think about our systems. And if there are people who do research in the room or you can collaborate with people doing research to help figure out systematically what are the things that we can do best. And I like the words that I'm about to put up here. When you see a need, you can build something that tries to address that need. Maybe it's not in your wheelhouse and you're not sure how to do it really well, but you know someone else out there who does. Maybe you can buy that service from them, right? Maybe you can say, we don't need to reinvent all this. Here's some money, can you help do this for us, right? Um, or do you broker something? We'll help you out with this if you help us out with this. You don't need to take on everything yourself, but figure out who those other folks are and figure out how you can help each other, buy services from each other, or trade off or do something like that. Um, I'll close my section here by reminding us that before we had all these fancy economic analyses, brain scans, cortisol assays, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, Frederick Douglass reminded us that it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men, right? He understood how important early life is. He understood what the environments around children result in, and he understood that stability matters, right? And I think it's all encapsulated in what he had to say there. Um, we'll have questions later, of course, uh, but if you do uh, any kind of social media, follow me, Facebook, Twitter, um, or email if you don't have a chance to chat with me afterwards. And with that, I will turn it over to my, my colleagues. Thank you.
morning, everyone. So as introduced, I'm Lisa Gizzi, um, Health Department Director in Eau Claire, which you may wonder why I'm in Madison talking. Um, and, and really, my job today in a few minutes is to um, help you think about, again, your role in housing and put the health lens on it from a very local level, wherever you sit. Um, if you leave with nothing else today, I want you to say, yeah, maybe health is a lens I should pay attention to in whatever job you are doing locally. And maybe I should talk to someone at my local health department if I don't know them. How many of you know someone at your local health department? Okay, so some of you do, but some of you have some work to do if you take that challenge on, right? So I challenge you to really think about that. After hearing this morning's keynote, I also would challenge you to say, make it personal. Um, in public health, I will own that we often talk about populations and we talk about big problems and the population health issues. It's about people. And I think we had a really good reminder this morning that get to know people. And I think that's been one of the most powerful things for me as a health department director to actually you know, we heard about Doug, who our speaker met as she walked in. Um, meet some Dougs in your community, talk to them. And I think that power is so amazing. I was sharing with Joff at the end of the speaker conversation that, and I'll talk a little bit about our housing program, but the assistant director in our office as I was leaving work yesterday, with almost tears in her eyes said, Liska, I was driving into work this morning and she drives past our local homeless shelter and one of the people that we've been working with for years related to um, unstable housing issues, he's had, he has enormous mental health issues, we know him by name, he has created lots of challenges if you want to look at him as the problem in successfully being in housing, was walking out of the homeless shelter. And Marissa just looked at me, she's like, again, we're the problem. We are also the solution, but we are also part of the problem. So I own that as well, standing up in front of you as part of government. My job today is to quickly talk through what we do in Eau Claire related to unsafe and unhealthy housing, as well as how we're thinking about affordable housing. One of my priorities the last couple of years, um, really I've named to my bosses two big priorities that actually connect to what we just um, heard from my colleague that spoke this morning. Housing is a public health issue. What are we gonna do about that? What can we effectively do about that? And Nurse Family Partnership Program, which I hadn't thought about before I came up to the stage today because really an NFP exists in Dane County. So as a housing person, every one of you should be saying to anybody you talk to, support NFP funding. NFP, Nurse Family Partnership, is a early intervention program that is evidence-based, that works with um, higher risk families from pregnancy through the first two years of life to do exactly what Depeche was talking about, create supportive environments for success. So, you know, frankly, I would add, if you do nothing else, that's a housing program. Nurse Family Partnership is a housing program. So, I could talk for, as I told Jeff, I could, talk about all the things I heard this morning, but no big surprise that on a very basic level, unsafe housing is um, unhealthy housing. So lead, indoor air pollution, drinking water, sanitary conditions, these are the things that health departments deal with every day. You heard about the mold issue, that's just shocking to me that she didn't get support, but you know, mold in housing is something that staff in our office go and investigate all the time. I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on that. In Eau Claire, we've worked really hard the last, we, weirdly, the housing inspection program sits at the health department. That is very odd for Wisconsin. Um, but we think it's awesome because it means that when we go into a home, the staff that's going in there have a health lens on what they do. We rewrote the housing code in Eau Claire a couple of years ago using the American Public Health Association um, language that they have as a model. And we really spent time on thinking about what are the minimum standards that um, can be created. And frankly, we have some really challenging state statutes and rules that we had to 
wind our way around, and I can talk to you more in person because people are like, how did you get that code to work? So I can talk to you about that, and we're still working through it. But we do have code that says that we have to have safe housing from a health perspective. Um, I have lots more resources, and I'm, you know, again, I could talk about this as just a, a whole session, but we work hard to make sure that we're aligning what we do in housing with making it healthier. Um, part of what we do with community development, community development block grant dollars that we've been fortunate enough to receive as a health department is we have funding partly to do this program, but also to spend time on doing an exterior condition survey. So every five years, every part of the city of Eau Claire gets looked at on the outside by college students. We use college students and hire them during the summer to do this to get a scan at what does our housing look like and where do we need to target some interventions. Um, and we develop maps. So one of the overlays I'll tell you that I'll talk a lot about is that poverty is connected to our housing issues. So this is the city of Eau Claire and you can't I obviously see the colors here but the um, in between some of those blue rivers is a very low income neighborhood which is highlighted here. And these are all in color the places that have more than four or five exterior housing violations. So we know that, again, this is neighborhood specific, place matters, and poverty matters. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot more about our housing inspection program. It creates problems, but it also has given us some assets. So, again, we placard homes that are unsafe, and then we have to figure out where people live. And as I gave the example, Marissa sees that person in the homeless shelter. That's not our goal, but we understand that's part of the problem we create. Um, if you've not read the book Evicted, and I assume many, if not most people in this room have, I, I really strongly recommend you read it. It's not a Milwaukee book. It's a every one of our communities book. Um, and we have those issues in Eau Claire. This is the Eau Claire website. I will just say, you know, you can look there for our housing specific program materials. I have a couple of copies of things from our, um, from that website that we hand out. I think one of the challenges that I would give to you is that making information accessible to people is really important. I don't know, we talked about an eviction letter. Often it's in, things are in language that none of us would understand, frankly. Helping make things understandable, readable, using pictures, using, um, you know, thinking about translating into various languages is critically important. Um, so then, oh, that's funny. Yeah. So, um, so unaffordable and unequitable housing is something also that we are working on in Eau Claire. And part of that is because we do, maybe a little different than Madison-Dane County, we are ranked the second highest county with poverty. People are shocked by that. If you've ever been in Eau Claire, you'd never guess it. Um, but poverty is a real issue. Income insecurity is also a real issue. We're 70th out of 72 counties for income inequality, I'm sh sorry. So we have very wealthy people in Eau Claire and very, very poor people in Eau Claire. That is an independent factor that connects to health. It's something that we need to pay attention to. And if you've not looked at the ALICE report, again, that's something I strongly encourage you to look at. But in Eau Claire, for a person that is a single adult, for a survival budget, they need to have an hourly wage of $12.25. I mean, many, 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 many people don't. 40% of our overall county population doesn't make that amount of money. And 60% in some of our communities, in the city of Eau Claire and the city of Fairchild, they, they're not there. 60% of the population, they can't afford housing. We can't just say, get a house. It doesn't work. Um, and, and Eau Claire is one of the brown counties on the left-hand side that gives you some perspective about where we are. We are also... You know, again, 
a county that has an unaffordable, the, the, how the renter affordability issue is there. All the brown counties are ones that are not affordable. People can't find rental um, counties. One of the jobs of the health department is tracking this kind of data, paying attention to it and highlighting it. So I'll say that's what part of what we're doing. This kind of data, nobody had collected eviction records in Eau Claire and looked at them. This is back in 2016 because we had a student to do it. I don't know if it's true in Dane County, but eviction records are on microfiche to look at counts and to try, I mean, we literally had to have a student to count and look at the reasons for evictions. So that's the kind of stuff that, you know, we need to understand it and call it out. Um, this was just tracking it over time, but people said to me, we have that many evictions in Eau Claire? Again, using data to call out a problem I think is critically important. Um, Joff is gonna talk a whole lot more about policies and programs at work, so I'm actually gonna say what works for health website has some policies and programs. The Wisconsin Public Health Association, I currently have the honor of being president of that group, but if you don't know WPHA, all of you working in housing are public health people, and I strongly encourage you to consider connecting with someone that's a WPHA member or joining WPHA. In fact, we had some people in the room presenting at WPHA last year. Wisconsin Public Health Association cares, and Wisconsin Association of Local Health Departments and Boards, which is the government entity, um, developed some key priorities. And I share this with you because, again, as you just heard, policies are important. And so our two organizations are saying, we need some state policies that really focus on justice reform, early childhood education, income stability and employment, and housing. Do, do any of those have the word health in it? They don't, right? So we had a lobbyist that was scanning state legislation for the last, I don't know, 10 years for our organizations. And frankly, they would look for the word health and then they would bring it to us saying, are you opposed or are you for this legislation? And Joff and I were both part of this group and, and we, we have gotten them and gotten our colleagues to understand, don't just look for the word health, look for the words income and education and employment because those are public health policies. Again, Jeff's gonna share a whole lot more about that. The two things that those organizations are working on are low-income housing tax credits. You heard about that this morning. We need more of them. And we need programs that look at lead and asbestos. So those are important as well. I'll, I'll leave you with just a final um, couple of thoughts. Um, it is personal. Uh, and I think the more we care and the more we see the people that are experiencing the challenges, the better. Yesterday I had coffee with um, a colleague, someone that um, the first time she met me, she um, was shaking. And she sat down and she said, Liska, thanks for having coffee. I didn't know her. Um, we sat down and talked. She um, is a, has a conviction history. She has a big eviction history, um, significantly addicted to drugs at different points in her life. She's a mom. She's a person living in my community. She is a person that cares about what is happening. She's currently, she, she has worked to, with support to be part of the solution now. And I've known her for a number of years now, but Sarah and I yesterday had coffee. Um, and every time I sit with her and interact with her, I learn something. And we have to remember that, that I may be a health department director, but I learn every single day from people that I've experienced in a real way. And, and she can say, Liska, don't do it that way, that's stupid. Really think about how you set up policies and programs so they make a difference. So that chair story this morning, Sarah would be my touch point. Everybody should here should have that touch point to say, is this a good idea or is this really stupid? So a final challenge to you about where to go forward with. So I'm gonna turn it over to Joff to talk about um, the work he's done and then we'll have questions at the end. Please know that I'll stay afterwards though and share um, what you'd like to know about what's happening in Eau Claire. All right. 
I'm Jeff Swain. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to try to keep my comments fairly short so that we have time for our questions and answers and discussion. Um, I'm uh, here in part because of my, let's see, did we miss a slide? Okay, well, I'm here in part because of my work with the um, Healthy Housing Initiative. And uh, I'd like to also let you know that all of my slides are in a handout uh, in your packet. So uh, you can uh, refer to them at your, at your leisure. And I do need to um, credit my colleagues at the Healthy Housing Initiative, which is looking at the ways in which housing policy affects health outcomes. And those are uh, primarily folks at the uh, Community Advocates Public Policy Institute, as well as UW-Madison uh, School of Social Work and the School of Medicine and Public Health, which is uh, my employer, and the Wisconsin Partnership Program. So I'm just going to um, give a, a little overview of that Healthy Housing Initiative and then uh, just highlight a couple of policies that are evidence-based around uh, housing policies and health uh, in these three focus areas of housing quality, housing affordability, and housing stability, and policies that are at multiple levels, federal, state, local, regional, uh, even uh, to some degree uh, corporate and then a, a word or two on, on potential pathways for policy action. So, oh, there's my, there's my uh, acknowledgement slide. So what we did, um, we, over the last two years, have done a lot of uh, literature review. We've done a bunch of quantitative and qualitative research. We've held multiple focus groups. We've got a large, diverse advisory committee. Uh, we pulled together more than 65 potential policy options that would improve housing affordability, stability, or quality, and therefore have evidence that they would also improve health outcomes. We evaluated the available evidence regarding their effectiveness in these areas, and then we prioritized almost uh, 30 of them. About uh, 28 are ones that I've listed in the handout. And I just want to um, kind of circle back to Depeche's uh, uh, comments, the main pathway by which these uh, policies in these three areas work, there's sort of two main pathways. One is around housing quality and things that Liska pointed out that are sort of physical uh, quality issues that directly affect people's health, lead hazards, mold, asthma triggers, uh, unsafe uh, stairways, electrical code violations, these kinds of things. But the vast majority of the policies around affordability and stability are improving health because they're reducing chronic toxic stress. Just as Depeche was talking about, they're reducing chronic elevations of cortisol and adrenaline. They're reducing uh, people's risk of long-term diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, and children's risk of adverse uh, brain development because of chronic toxic stress. That's how these policies work. So. Um, Again, in your um, in your handout, they're sort of split into these three uh, these three areas. And the first one is quality. We've got four uh, policy recommendations here, and I'm not going to list every, talk about every single policy. But um, the the work that's being done in Eau Claire is really um, uh, really at the forefront, at the vanguard. And part of the reason is is right now there's a state preemption on allowable fees for uh, code inspections around, uh, around certifying uh, our licensing rental units and assuring that they are safe and habitable. And so there's a state policy issue here, and then there would be local policy issues to try to um, implement these kind, of, uh, these kind of inspections. And even starting small with something like just focusing on lead hazards would be really, really terrific because uh, lead uh, toxic exposure to lead, the main source of lead for kids is deteriorating lead-based paint and the dust that gets around inside and out. Um, this, if we could at least have a policy that allows for lead-safe certification for housing units, that would be a really good start. So again, I'm not going to go through each one of these policies because I want to leave time for questions. In terms of affordability, we've subdivided affordability into two kinds of thinking about affordability. One is around increasing the number of affordable units, and the second is around increasing income, which I'll get to in a second. But um, there's uh, 
some key policies that are uh, available around affordability and increasing the number of affordable units. And uh, they have to do with increasing funding for housing choice uh, vouchers. They have to do with adopting small area fair market rates, uh, in a, particularly in a region. Uh, your handout says Milwaukee, but there's also the same problem with uh, Madison, Dane County region. There's areas where their rents are much higher, areas where rents are lower within the region. And if uh, you don't use the small area fair market rent approach, then this is a problem for the housing choice vouchers. So these are, um, these are regional policies as well as, as federal and, and state policies. Uh, tax incremental financing for affordable housing. Uh, there's issues around exclusionary zoning. Uh, this is a, a problem that um, is really a, uh, uh, a, a problem at the federal level as well as the state level and uh, a regional level as well. And not only ending exclusionary zoning, but then putting in place policies uh, primarily at the local and regional level uh, to allow for inclusionary zoning, which again right now there are barriers to doing that because of state policy. So these are all kind of linked together. Employer assisted housing, uh, that's been mentioned before, and there's ways that government can support that, but this is also a big area for uh, the private sector and organizational policy to, to step in as well. Um, low income housing tax credits, that's uh, been mentioned, and I think there's you know two aspects to that at least. One is to make sure that the uh, funding for uh, these kinds of incentives for developers uh, continues or is expanded, and then there's the preserving of existing uh, low income housing that was built using low income housing tax credits <coughs> that, that their, the low income uh, requirement is starting to expire and that needs to really be uh, really be looked at. I'm going quickly because these are all in your in your uh, slides and I want to leave time for questions but I do want to emphasize the income side of affordability right because uh, the definition of being rent burdened is more than 30 percent of your income on housing costs so the two parts of that equation are your income and housing costs so we can get at it by increasing the availability of lower rents, we can also get at it by increasing income, and it's really important. And there's minimum wage, transitional jobs, I'd like to talk about more if I had time. I really want to emphasize, though, the earned income tax credit. Earned income tax credit is both a federal uh, and a state uh, policy, and states that have higher uh, contributions to earned income tax credit have uh, healthier outcomes. In fact, there's some good prospective studies that show that when states increase their earned income tax credit, they actually improve birth outcomes, they, imp they reduce chronic illnesses, it's, it's remarkable. And one way that they do that among many is that they make, they, they support the, um, the income of working poor people. That's what the earned income tax is for, credit is for. You can't get it if you don't have earned income. But um, for working poor, it increases income and it, it contributes, among other things, to housing stability. It, there's other aspects of this that could be uh, supported as well. Right now, the earned income tax credit is delivered as a lump sum once a year when you file your taxes. But there are some states that have done some pilots where they make it a monthly period, monthly payment. It's much better for uh, people to try to apply that to their, to their rent than getting it once a year and trying to save it. And then um, finally, um, uh, we've got uh, some uh, policy recommendations around housing stability and reducing evictions. And probably the number one recommendation from our group is going to be reforming uh, CCAP. CCAP is uh, the consolidated, uh, I forget the exact uh, word for it, the consolidated uh, criminal justice, uh, the court automation program, consolidated court automation program. And so people who are, I'm sure many of you in this room know this, but um, this is kind of new to me, the, the idea that people who are involved in an eviction proceeding, that goes into CCAP. And CCAP is publicly available. So landlords check CCAP when they look at um, people's housing applications. And you get into CCAP if you've been involved in an eviction proceeding, even if that eviction proceeding was thrown out by the judge. You're still in it and then your next prospective landlord is still seeing that. This, this is a, a policy 
um, issue that needs to be fixed. And it's also connected to uh, criminal justice policy reform because anybody who's had any sort of uh, conviction for any reason, they're in CCAP too. And so you, you know, like these things stay on your record for 20 years or, or longer in CCAP and it really makes it hard for someone that's had some criminal involvement in the past that maybe they've been in prison and they've come out, they're trying to get reintegrated into society. And one of the things we say is you've got to have stable housing or we're going to put you back in prison. We're going to revoke your supervision. And it's hard to get stable housing if you're you know, listed in CCAP because landlords are checking it. So we really need to reform CCAP. Um, and then there's a number of other things here, again, that could be done uh, in a local area, city or county, around a just cause eviction and supporting tenant landlord mediation or establishing a right to counsel for, uh, for eviction proceedings. And then I think uh, standardized lease uh, or rental agreements are also uh, really important. And uh, Housing First, which has already been mentioned, I think that's uh, it's really crucial as well. <coughs> and uh, I could talk at some other point about Badger Care and using um, Medicaid funding for not only uh, wraparound services, which uh, right now the state is uh, initiating a pilot on, but ideally in the long run, and this would require federal policy change, to use Medicaid to directly support rents. That, that would be remarkable. And there's, like, there's no, I don't have a uh, conceptual issue with this because housing is health. And so if we're going to use health dollars, Medicaid dollars, to support health, and we're not going to use them to support people to be in healthy housing, then I, I, I don't know why we wouldn't. So uh, for many of you are probably very involved and probably a lot smarter and more experienced than I am in terms of policy advocacy, um, but just maybe for a few of you that, that aren't, I think there's, there's things you can do on your own that are important and things that are better to do together. And um, I've, I've kind of listed them on these next two slides, so I'm not going to uh, talk about them or read them to you because I want to leave time for questions and answers. Um, again, I want, I've got too many people to thank. Um, this is work that is done uh, as a group and it's a collective work, so um, you can reach me uh, this way and let's go ahead and open it up for questions and answers. Thank you. Can we get a microphone out? Um, the first speaker talked about um, the risk to um, uh, social benefits if one's in, uh, salary increases. Um, if somebody goes into a subsidized housing and is um, eligible for 30% of the income towards that and their income goes up, how, how does that affect how much they have to pay? Is that uh, changed or is it the rate at which they go in. Um, I'll look at my colleagues. I don't think I don't think any of us know the specifics of that answer. What we know is that conceptually, these sorts of cliffs are an issue. Um, I, w I imagine there's other people in the room who would know the exact answer to the the details of your question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, she's running a mic yeah. someplace, yeah. <laughs> In what ways would you reform CCAP? Well, I think there are, there are a number of uh, reforms that need to happen with CCAP. Uh, the, f the first and most obvious one in my mind that relates to housing is that if a person has been involved in an, in an eviction proceeding that, that, that was thrown out by the court, that should, that should never show up on CCAP. So that's like the very first basic place to start. Um, I think there, there need to be some more stringent limits on how long uh, an eviction would stay available on CCAP. 20 years is ridiculous. Um, and I think there are a number of other uh, uh, sort of more related to criminal justice issues and how, how long these other records stay on depending on what the, you know, the conviction was for. Uh, those, you know, there's, they, they just should stay on for a much shorter period of time. I mean, basically, we, uh, you know, we, we, we've got, you know, like I could talk for another hour on criminal justice and health, uh, but we've got a state that 
uh, Wisconsin, you know, has a very high rate of incarceration, very high rate of racial disparity in incarceration, one of the worst in the nation. And, um, you know, we've got uh, somewhere over 22,000 people in prison at any given time. And uh, we send another 8,000 back to prison every year for violations of parole and probation that um, weren't a conviction of a new crime. These things are all, all in CCAP, and they're there, like, f for way too long. And, and frankly, is, is eviction a crime? I mean, I think right. that's the fundamental question we should all ask ourselves, right? So if this is a, I mean, I, I would like to have a criminal justice online system where I can see if there is someone that has been a child abuser that's out living next to me with four children. That might be an important thing to have available, but do I need to know that the person living next to me has been evicted? I mean, what purpose does that serve in our state? So I, I mean, I would say we should all ask ourselves that, right? Is it a crime? This is a criminal justice system online tool that, you know, someone can look you up. Uh, I have a question about um, how serious are we about trying to create an op opportunities for those who have had a history, uh, mm -hmm. those who have been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. it, because when you look at African American, this, these kinds of things <clears throat> affect us disproportionately. Yeah. So what kind of serious work is being done to ensure that when people come out of incarceration, that they can find a place to stay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and get jobs. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really crucially important question, and um, you know, I certainly uh, would agree with the the tone of the question that we're not doing nearly enough. Uh, there there are some uh, initiatives. Uh, there's some good work being done here in Madison and Dane County by Nehemiah and others, um, and at the same time, we've got a lot more to do. I think. Um, there's, uh, there's some uh, really interesting data uh, coming out recently that shows that uh, with the exception of a few specific types of convictions, generally people coming out of prison are not uh, a, a, at any increased risk for uh, being a, 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 a suboptimal tenant than anybody else, like, with some few exceptions. So I think we need to start taking a, like a, a really data-informed approach to this. I think that there's some uh, good progress that's being made around transitional jobs programs. There's a lot more that could be done to support that. Um, I think we, we um, have found, though, that uh, employers like transitional jobs programs because they allow the employer to kind of test out whether they need a new employee and to test out like how that new employee is specifically working out. And some of them are specifically aimed at uh, individuals who are, are coming back from, from incarceration. So there's, there's a, a lot more that we need to be doing in this area. Uh, it's really crucial. And just to give a couple of local examples, I think that's the question we should all ask, absolutely. In Eau Claire, our county budget is coming forward, and there are four new um, jail employees proposed in our county budget, and zero of those employees are social workers, are people that are working with individuals that are currently incarcerated to figure out what they're going to do next after they leave that county jail. We got to say something about that. We last year got into the budget a one social worker to work with people that are leaving the jail system. And it, that's a little step. That's a kind of program and policy that we should be starting to think about. Certainly we don't want as many people in the incarceration system, but one social worker working with everybody coming out of the jail in Eau Claire. Um, so those are examples. I would also say that, again, we're part of the problem. They built a... Um, a lot of work was done to develop a low-income um, unit that was opened with lots of fanfare last week in one of our communities. And um, at the same time, we were working with a mobile home park that looks like it's going to be um, closed down entirely, 50 families maybe with no place to live because of the living conditions. And people that were planning this new low-income 
um, unit and talking about how wonderful it is in our community to have that said, we don't want those people living here though, those people. We want it to be successful. So think about the language choices. And these are people that really mean well, but we need to step back and think about how the language we use and are, are we really wanting to help? I think your question is right. Do we really want to make a difference? So keep asking that question. I, I will also add briefly that one of the challenges in, uh, in all of this, in, in, in educating people about the question is getting them to recognize how difficult it is, you know, to be to be released from, from incarceration and how um, the deck is stacked. Uh, one thing for me personally that was very important was several years ago um, participating in a prisoner release simulation, recognizing that no simulation can truly, you know, recreate what people are really going through but you started to recognize how many challenges and asks were being put on people, some of which were mutually conflicting and impossible. Um, and it really helped um, uh, open my eyes as to, wow, this is, this is really, really difficult. Um, and uh, and, and I, 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 it was ter hard to go through, even on a short term, you know, in, as part of a simulation. So I think that's another part of the whole question. Dr. Nipsiria, uh, you spoke of provider referrals to patient service needs. I, I work for a Medicaid managed care organization and increasingly uh, state Medicaid agencies are asking us to incentivize uh, partnerships between healthcare providers we contract with and housing agencies and social services to increase access to nutrition, uh, food, and uh, housing and transportation. First, do uh, value-based purchase provider incentives work from your perspective, and how can state Medicaid agencies and Medicaid managed care organizations help providers create those referrals and um, incentives to uh, help individuals that need access to those social services? So, so how can um, state Medicaid agencies and health departments and my organization help providers to create those linkages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, despite all the conversation about value-based payments that has happened uh, uh, over the last several years, we're not really seeing a whole lot out of that. Um, the system still currently, sadly, financially incentivizes high-volume, middling quality care. Um, uh, care coordination is not paid for. Um, and honestly, my, my brush is up against um, with uh, managed care organizations trying to do something. Usually consists of someone sending me a list of these are the kids in your practice who have not had lead screenings at 12 months of age. Okay, great. Can you help me making phone calls and find out why they haven't come in, et cetera? Oh, no, no, I can't have that. But here's your database list. I'm like, well, thank you. I know that. But if they, can't, if they don't come in, I can't help them with that. Right. So what we have is a lot of parallel efforts to basically tell people what isn't happening, but not as much to actually try to rectify the situation. Um, I would argue that embedding um, personnel within clinics to help uh, with the job of care coordination, uh, to help talk to families and find out what are their issues, right? What is it transportation? Um, is it timing of clinic, uh, you know, um, availability, um, et cetera, et cetera, and to really work towards what can we do to make sure that they're getting what they need um, will be a number one thing. But that requires, I think, a clear partnership, and it requires thinking again about what are we actually paying for. When we have a system that says, please spend your hour, uh, financially incentivizes you to spend an hour looking at six ear infections rather than trying to figure out a preschooler's behavior problems, okay, that's something wrong. So I agree with you on all of that, and I think we need to work together to try to make sure that we're not duplicating simply uh, notification of problems and not trying to actually solve them. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ed Wall. I'm the former Corrections Secretary, so I found your mm. comments particularly interesting. And I also find myself in the position now where I'm the Director of the Housing Authority in DeForest. And going from, in, there's a funny story with how that all happened, I'd be happy to tell you privately. But when I was first asked about what kind of experience I had in housing, I said I run 39 gated communities. Uh, and then I explained to them what I did and why. And now I, one of the frustrations I had as the Corrections Secretary was when we had inmates releasing from prison was finding them the basics to make them successful, which was housing, which was some kind of an income, some kind of transportation, all things that really reflect back in the housing area. And then as I came into my position and found out that one of the things I had to check mark against potential applicants was their criminal record. 
and looking at their eviction record. Uh, I've talked to HUD about this. I find this to be tr particularly troubling because this group that we want to be successful, we want to reduce recidivism, we're kicking them onto the street, and by the way, you're probably not gonna get into public housing, which will be the only thing that you can afford, and we have no answers for that. Uh, I, I agree with almost everything you said. This is where I ran afoul of the former governor and wrote a book about him, um, but my problem was that and, and they, they accused me of turning into a Democrat because I actually became educated and said, we don't have a system that's working, we have to fix this. And there's a lot that we can do on the housing side of the house. And, and I know every one of us who is an executive director running a housing authority, you have no openings most likely. Nobody does. And I get 30 calls a week from people, some with very heartbreaking stories. And I have to tell them, I'm sorry, I don't have a unit to put you into. Uh, and that's very hard to tell someone who's homeless or is about to become homeless. And when I take into consideration that along with releasing incarcerated individuals into our, into, back into our communities, what's the answer? And I've told HUD that we really need to address this and we need to drop some of these barriers that we put up for formerly incarcerated individuals because as was mentioned, we have a very high uh, disproportionate rate of African American incarceration. We have a lot of things going against us, but Wisconsin's a pretty good state. We're pretty smart. We should be able to figure out a way to try and address this. And I'm open to doing anything and I applaud your efforts. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to really thank you for those comments. That's that's those are really important. And I, I, I want to add that, um, you know, there a lot of us carry around, I think, stereotypes with some founding probably about uh, people from different political parties and, you know, who's sort of going to be feeling what about what. But uh, as far as I know, everybody wants to be safe. And as far as I know, nobody wants to spend more money than we should. Nobody wants, you know, too, 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 you know and, we, and yet we spend more on uh, criminal justice in this state than we spend on the entire UW system, all campuses combined. And the fact is that it's, uh, it's uh, cheaper to find housing for someone coming out of prison than it is to have them go back to prison, right? And um, if we don't find housing and other supports around employment, et cetera, for people who are coming out of prison, it makes us less safe. So I, I really don't actually understand why we can't all get together on this. Just to follow up with what you said to give you an idea of the cost, because a lot of people don't understand the cost, it's $32,000 a year to keep somebody in prison right now. I don't get anywhere near that on the rents from my folks who are low income. On top of that, as you mentioned, the budget, it, the Department of Corrections, $2.65 billion biannually, $3.7 million a day. If the Packers went to the playoffs, my overtime in one day was $1 million. Yet we spend all that money on incarceration, but we don't put anywhere near that back into the housing issues. So. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. We have to stop now. Like I said, I think um, the intersection of housing and health, um, we could be talking about this for weeks, and I really appreciate you all coming, and I hope to see you again and, and have you back. Um, we do, um, we have another session, so let's take a few minutes, um, use the facilities down the way, this way, and, um, and yeah, on to the next one. But thank you so much for coming, really appreciate that perspective. <laughs>